Okay, so you'll have this in, the cha in a, one of the upcoming chapters that you have to read, but what this all gets to is the notion of filters, is that we don't perceive reality objectively as it is. I believe they said, that's my belief, I believe there's an objective reality out there. I believe that science does have somewhat accurate models of reality. But when it comes to human interactions, which is the topic of study of this class, you have to start to study the subjective aspects of reality. So when you try to understand how aesthetic judgment, ethical judgments, uh, cultural judgments, you have to study the subjective. And then that means you have to start to understand how, we, how do we filter reality? What are those filters that we apply to reality? And how are they different from one person to another? What are your filters and how are they, or how are they different from other people's filters? That's, that's going to be a key part of what we're going to learn in this class. You will be the object of study. So you're going to devote a lot of time studying yourself, your own psychology, meaning your own filters. Like some of them we share. We're all human beings here. So evolutionary psychology gives us some clues about what are some universal filters we share. Now it makes some difference based on gender. You will say men don't perceive reality exactly the same way that women do, especially in terms of mate selection. So, uh, but you know, in other ways, we react the same way. Uh, culture, that's already starting to be a little more complex. We have some diversity here. We have people coming from slightly, you know, uh, from different cultures, different subcultures within the US or different national cultures. So that's, uh, that's already a source of difference. Now, you, you have even more different types of filters. We all have different parents and our parents have different ideological beliefs. They come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. They have different life stories. We grew up in, in different towns, different parts of the world, some big towns and small towns, some rich neighborhoods or less rich neighborhoods. We have had different friends. We went to different schools. We have a whole life. All of us have had a different life. I found this very interesting uh, for myself. I have an identical twin brother, so I, I shared that at the beginning of the class, so, which means that I share the same genes as he does, so we have the same genetics. And we also have the same family, we have the same parents. And we also went through the same developmental stages at the same time, so we went to school at the same age, we had the same kind of life milestones that we went through at the same time, and we, we exchanged a lot during that time. So we developed a very similar outlook on life, up to a certain point when, you know, we were in the same school until we were 19. Then we went to different, we both went to business school, but we went to different business schools. And then I went to Portugal and the US and he stayed in Europe and it, we picked different professions and I started, you know, living in the US and developing, you know, adopting another culture. And we've gone to very different ways. So I've seen how with different trajectories in life, how our worldview has become very different. To the point that even though we sure, still share the same original trunk of experience, we've really branched out in different ways, right? Uh, so it's a very interesting way to see how our psychology and filters change based on your, the choices you make and the environment you're exposed to, the type of people you hang out with. Uh, so one key aspect of or, 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 um, concept that I like to emphasize is the notion of worldview, uh, which I have here, worldview. And I use this in a particular uh, way. So I, I don't mean by your worldview, your political beliefs, or your ideological beliefs, or your cultural beliefs. What I mean by worldview, your worldview, the way I define it, is the, fil the, the overarching filter or set of filters that you use to make sense of reality. So a world, you, you, each of us have a different worldview, meaning that we, the worldview is what allows us to, to understand what is an opportunity, what is a threat, what does that situation mean for me, and we all interpret it slightly differently. 
So what I'd like to, uh, to say is we have uh, 16 students plus me, that's uh, 17, 17 people in this class. I, mean, I should not touch that mic. Uh, so we have 17 different people, and that means that 17 different classes are happening at the same time. So not one of us is experiencing exactly the same moment. We each interpret it slightly differently. The meaning that certain words have for you are all a little bit different. Uh, the meaning of certain of the images that put there all have, you have slightly different reactions to them. Right, so you, your filters are slightly different. We all have slightly different filters. Now we hope that we somewhat on the same page, you know, through language, English language, and through some common memory, some common theories, but we all have slightly, you know, sometimes vastly different interpretation of the same theory, the same sentence. So that's, that, that's all a product of your worldview. So uh, this is a model, this is a, my attempt at summarizing different fields of, of psychology and explain how that happens. So um, you have reality out there, which you filter, and then you, know, you perceive that reality, you have particular different motivations, different emotions, uh, and then you have thought, you know, which I call cognition, and you have impulsive or intuitive actions, and that, you know, that produces your behavior. But I would say, like, even though, so, you have a theory called the rational actual theory that is privileged in fields like finance and economics. Right? If you've taken an economics class, probably you've heard about utility maximization, right? Utility maximization. The idea is how do we make economic decisions, like consumption? How do we decide to buy something? We make a calculation of how much utility will it bring me, might be conscious or unconscious, and we, we choose the uh, consumption that will bring us the maximal utility, right? And the idea, like, you know, at least in, uh, in economics, is that we're rational, we, we're good optimizers, so you know, we, you know, we decide, should I buy uh, pasta or rice, and how much of it, what type of pasta should I, you know, based on other stuff that I have going on in my life, and uh, we make the best choice by reasoning about it. Now, how often do we actually do that? Uh, I would say, like, not very often. You go to the supermarket and you don't think about, huh, how do you optimize my utility? And I'll make my, you know, consumption choices based on that, you know. You rarely do that when you uh, select a mate. You go to a party, you decide, you know, you've, who's your, you know, admi admitting you're single. Uh, you know, how do you decide who you're attracted to? You don't utilize, you don't maximize you. Sometimes, okay, some of us get calculated, you know, when it's time to get married or something. But usually, you know, you don't, you know, usually you just follow your attraction, your intuition, right? Uh, so, you know, while there are some actions that are reasoned, we sometimes make reasoned action, there's a whole host of other actions that are then automatic pilots that have to do with our worldview. Our worldview is what shapes, is the filter that allows us to understand the meaning of a situation and take action. Your worldview is, to a large extent, unconscious. Like when I was asking you, when you answered earlier about where you decide to put your attention, and you said, when I sit on a table in a classroom, I know that I'm supposed to pay attention to what the professor is saying in the screen, right? Even though that's not always true. Sometimes your attention veers to something else, you know? Your cell phone or, you know, you, you zone out, right? You, you have other thoughts coming out. But that's particular socialization that uh, you have that's not something that you consciously decide to do. That's something that is so ingrained in you. You've been so often, so long in school that you just know that that's where you have to put your attention on, right? You don't think back and be like, oh, you know, when I was four years old and I went to preschool, you know, I got reprimanded for, you know, zoning out, you know, and that's why I should pay attention. But you've internalized it. It's become unconscious, right? So you, our worldviews, all of the experiences that we've had in our lives, the, the, the way our parents interacted with us, the way our teachers interacted with us, the way our siblings interacted with us, good things and bad things that happened to us, all of that is integrated in our memory, but it's not consciously available to us at any time. We might, if we, if we think about what happened in our past, remember certain events, but most of the time they've just shaped us to react in certain ways unconsciously. Right, so 
For example, you might have grown up in a neighborhood where certain kinds of people were presented to you as a threat. You know, maybe you lived in a neighborhood with gangs, for example, and you, you learned to recognize maybe your parents and your friends, you know, and your other people led you to recognize this is the particular type of a gang member, <coughs> maybe certain tattoos or, you know, certain ways of, certain clothes, certain ways of handling themselves or walking, and you immediately recognize that person and you immediately experience fear and, you know, a, a conditioned reaction to move away, move to the other, you know, to, to avoid interaction with that person. Right? So that's an example of, how, of, an, of an unconscious filter that's acquired early in life. Uh, on the other hand, certain kind of people you maybe have learned to trust, to think that those people are people to approach. You know, certain kind of trustworthy, nice people, you know. And you have a stereotype of what that looks like. Right? So, uh, stereotyping is, uh, is, is an inherent part of our filters. I was mentioning earlier, we make judgments, we stereotype. That's not a bad thing, per se. That's essential. We cannot function without stereotyping, without simplifying. Stereotyping, mean, stereotyping means that we have a map of reality that allows us to recognize certain cues in the environment that have meaning, and we have reactions to it. Now, where stereotyping becomes a problem, and we'll, we'll talk about that next class, is when, we, when they become rigid and when they're wrong. Like, you might have grown up in a particular neighborhood, associate tattoos, you know, with gangs. Now you move to Cal Poly and tattoos are all the rage. And, you know, you continue to think that tattooed people are potentially dangerous, where in fact they might just be tattooed people, you know, you just you know, happen to like that, you know. They're not gang members. There's nothing dangerous about them. And you haven't updated your filter, right? So, so that's kind of like, that's, that's a problem with, with filters, you know, when they become rigid and not flexible, and when they lead us to wrong conclusions, when we change environments. Um, so uh, what's, what shapes our culture, uh, sorry, our worldview, uh, our, our collective, the collective history of the environment we live in, so our parents, our culture, but also our personal history. So I talked about how your parents and your culture give you a lot of filters. Uh, but past that, you yourself, in your life, become your own free agent and have personal adventures that uh, teach you certain lessons. So maybe... You know, uh, regardless of what your parents tell you, your parents might tell you these type of people don't associate with them, they're bad people, right? And uh, at school, you become friends with them and you realize, yeah, they're not at all what my parents say they are, you know? Or this thing that my parents always told me was really dangerous is not dangerous at all. Maybe you go to a different culture and you're like, whoa, you know, people do things that way that I, I thought was not the good thing to do. I and mean, you know, they enjoy it, you know? Uh, so, you know, you, you have your own experience and you start to, based on those experiences, good things and bad things happen. So you have pleasurable experiences, growing experiences, and you change your filters based on that. And then you have unpleasant experiences or failures that, you know, lead you to alter your filters as well. So, so there's a mixture of personal experience and collective wisdom passed on by your culture. And those shape your filters. The more individualized you become, or uh, you know, the more uh, actualized you become, the less you rely on collective filters and the more you rely on your personal filters. Part of growing up is growing out of your family and your culture and becoming your own person. Uh, so what's interesting when you look at worldview is that even though it's a very complex set of things, it constantly evolves. It's not static. As we grow in age, our worldview evolves. And there's even a field of psychology called uh, developmental psychology that talks about stages of development. It started with Piaget. One of the founders was Piaget, a, a Swiss psychologist uh, who studied children. He studied the, uh, the development of intelligence in children and found that they tend to go through different stages. 
So what he would do is, is for example, uh, give a problem to a child and ask them to solve it and observe how they ask them to solve it aloud, to reason aloud. And what he would found is uh, at different ages, we have different types of logic that we use. Uh, there's, there's also uh, another researcher called Kahlberg. I think it's, I forget if the H is here or here. I think it's here, but uh, Kahlberg. Uh, who studied moral developments and also found that we go through different stages. So for example, uh, let me give you an example of how Kohlberg determines that. Uh, there is a, um, here's a situation. Your uh, mother is, is dying of a, uh, of a uh, curable illness. It can be cured by a medication that's very expensive and you can't afford it. Right? There's a pharmacy uh, in your town that you decide to break into to steal the medication to save your mother, right? So now explain to me, why did you do that? Why is that moral? Why is that moral to steal the medicine, right? Uh, there's, level, there's level one logic is because I can get away with it. So I wasn't caught by the police, so I can get away with it, so it's moral, right? That's level one. You know? The children at certain points, very young children, you know, if you you know, put candy on the table and say, don't take the candy, and then leave the room, you know. If they steal the candy, most likely they will say, if I can get away with it, you know, that's moral. Right? That's their level of moral de development. Uh, the second level is uh, conformity. You, you do, you say, I do it because anybody would do it. So what, what, is, what's, you know, what other people do is what's, what you can get away with, right? So you, you, look, for, you look for others' behavior uh, to justify morally things. The third level is when you, you say it's moral because it's, there's a higher, you know, it's bad to steal, it's immoral to steal, but it's immoral to let my mother die. And I think that it's more important to save my mother than to not steal. So you create a hierarchy in your own mind of different ethical standards, and you decide that one is more important, you have your own hierarchy of ethical standards. And you solve, you know, that's the third level. You're like, uh, I know it's unethical what I did, but it's, uh, it's the most ethical thing you can do under the circumstances. That's post-conventional. You know. Regardless of what, you know, if everybody said it was wrong to steal, I would still do it because I, I want to save my mother. That's more important. Right? So, so that's an idea of stages of development. So, so you have uh, Piaget, Kohlberg, you have many other researchers that have looked at different stages of development. Here I come back to Wilbur. Ken Wilbur has come up with this, uh, I think it's, what is it, three... Uh, eight stage model which summarizes different kinds of models and the idea is that we tend to go as we age through different stages of development which are basic sets of rules and ways of thinking that influence our worldview it's not exactly your worldview but it's you know it's a certain orientation or ideology of your worldview if you will and uh, the idea is that these two stages are very rare so, you know, not everybody goes to the highest stages, according to Wilbur. We tend to stop at a certain stage. Uh, and, you know, he also, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, if we were going to get into that, it's very complicated. So if you're interested, you know, I can give you references to follow that. But, you know, all I wanted to mention is that, you know, there is a tendency for us to go through stages. And the way we move from one stage to another is that uh, happens in punctuated equilibrium fashion. So in evolutionary theory, this is a concept borrowed from evolution. So the, the original formulation of evolution by Darwin is that species tend to evolve to adapt themselves to their environment, right? to, to maximize their survival in a particular ecological niche or environment. And they have random mutation that occur. And if a random mutation, uh, genetic mu mu uh, mutation, leads to more, to better survivability, maximization of the gene pool, then that gets selected to, for the next uh, population, right? And that's how we have slow changes. So for example, how did, you know, like, this leads to question, how did, how did uh, birds develop wings, right? How did fish get out of water and, and you know, evolve their, fins to be limbs, right? 
it's kind of like mind-boggling to think about that. How did we develop eyes? You know, how did we develop the senses we have? In some, you know, you, you find animals now, for example, that used to have eyes, but they live in caverns in darkness where eyes have no value because you can't, you don't have light, and they de-evolve their eyes. You know, their eyes disappear. You know, so because it doesn't provide any additional survival uh, benefit. So. So that's kind of like the, the, the traditional formulation is it happens in a slow uh, way, you know, as, as a random mutation occur. But when you look at the actual fossils that we find, you find that it doesn't have, so the, the, the linear sort of view of evolution would be, would be like that, right? Now, it's, you know, this is time, right? And this is kind of like a, you know, fundamental like uh, changes in in our morphology and all that. Uh, but what we find in, in in reality is that it doesn't quite happen like that. Instead, the way evolution tends to happen is like that. So you have a species that stays pretty much the same for quite a while, and then for a relatively short period of time. Like you know, this might be like. This might be like two million years, right? And then, you know, during a relatively short time, like maybe, a, maybe a, you know, like, I don't know, 20,000 years, which is relatively short, right? You have radical shifts where the species changes or develops a new capacity, and then you have stability again for a while. And it happens in fits and starts like that, right? Uh, the same is true for our, you know, according to Wilbur, and other developmental psychologists with our worldviews. So we tend to develop a fairly stable worldview until we have a, a major leap. Now think about teenage years, right? Your teenage crisis, right? <laughs> You're a child, you have a, chi a fairly stable child worldview, and then puberty hits, and all kinds of change happen to your body and to your way of thinking, and you become an adolescent, right? Which is essentially kind of a young adult. So these short, very, very difficult years, a lot of change happens. And then, you know, you come on the other side as a young adult, right? And you, you have a stable new version of yourself. And then, you know, you might have another change, you know, maybe after college, maybe college, you know, or maybe after college, going to work, you know. Uh, maybe like, you know, getting married and having children, you know. You might have, you know, then there's the crisis of the 50s, right, or the 40s, you know. Uh, then there's, you know, retirement and the emptiness, you know, those might be like the different kind of like critical moments in a person's life where your worldview evolved, you know, maybe getting divorced, maybe uh, having a serious illness, maybe uh, having a huge drawback, you know, losing somebody that's close to you, you know, being dumped by somebody you're very much in love with, you know, having a near death moment, you know. So we have a few key experiences in our lives that can propel us into completely revising a worldview, they can be aha experiences where we're like, wow, I just realized something amazing about that I never thought about. I had a realization, you know. Uh, and, you know, you have your different worldview. So, I mean, you know, there, there's, there's two ways to see it. One way is to see it as a progression. Can Wilbur see this as a progression? The idea that, you know, we become more wider in our awareness, more evolved, right? Uh, others say, well, it's not really like hierarchical like that. It's just that, you know, it's more like that, you know, it's more like we tend to change our worldviews and one worldview is not better than another, it's just different, you know. I'm not sure, I mean, I tend to believe in the hierarchical view. If I look at my own experience, uh, you know, the idea is that, for Ken Wilber, is that each one of those stages includes the other ones. So when you're at this stage, you have a new capacity for seeing reality in a different way, but you still have these other stages available to you. You still can perceive reality in those stages. So that's how it would be a hierarchical. You know? I find this stuff fascinating and very interesting, and I, uh, that's all I'm going to say for now. So in your self-reflection paper, which is a very important assignment of this class, what you're going to do is explore your worldview. So you're going to look at your filters, and how do you do that? Mainly you're going to look at your history. So I'm going to ask you, I'll tell more about that. It's very hard to explore your own psychology. 
your own filters. Why? Because your filters are invisible to you. One, you know, like, uh, one way to see it is the, the uh, water for the fish. You know, there's a joke that goes uh, like this. Two teenage fish, fishes are swimming in the ocean and they meet an old wise fish and the old fish asks them, how's the water? And they keep swimming and they, after a while they look at each other and like, what is he talking about? Uh, they, they don't know what water is. They've never had the experience of not being in water. So it's just been the environment around them. The old fish baby has, you know, seen the atmosphere, you know, has jumped out of the water, uh, has experienced non-water. Uh, so, you know, your worldview is for most of us, we tend to think that reality, that our worldview is reality. We tend to mistake reality for our worldview. So we, we tend to be in an objectivist stance that I am objective, I am sane, therefore, and I perceive reality as it is. I don't, I don't have subjectivity. You know, I'm smart and rational and logical and therefore I'm right. And my filter, you know, my, my models of reality are accurate. So we don't tend to think about our filters. What I'm inviting to do is to, you know, I'm kind of contesting that and saying, well, you know, you have subjectivity, you have filters. Reality is not, you know, hopefully reality is somehow, somewhat, approximately how you, you know, coincides with your, filter, with your models of it. But your filters are also involved and they are your source of your own subjectivity. You might think of it as bias, that's a negative view to see it, or you might think of it as your own richness, your own idiosyncratic personality, who you are, you know, how you're different from others. So I'm going to ask you to explore that. Uh, and uh, part of it will involve describing your life story and key events that occur to you and how your parents were, what your culture was like, uh, and how you felt all about it.